And now we're going to move into our first panel, Innovative Policy Options for the Future of Business Risk Management Programming, with our moderator, Stuart Person from MNP. MNP is sponsoring this respective panel. It's all yours, Stu. Well, thank you, Mary, and uh, good morning, everyone. Um, as Mary said, my name is Stuart Pearson, and I will be your moderator for this panel called Innovation Policy Options for the Future of Business Risk Management Programs. Business risk management programs are meant to be a financial backstop for farmers facing production and market disruptions beyond their control. These programs were initially designed to provide income stabilization and disaster assistance in an integrated suite and were effective at the time, but they have been pared back over the years by respective governments with the most significant, significant recent change being made by the federal and provincial governments in 2012. The current program suite is failing to meet the needs of Canadian farmers and are insufficient in the face of continually increasing risks. As we start looking ahead to the new Canadian Agriculture Partnership in 2023, the panel will discuss the challenges and opportunities facing the sector and explore how innovative new tools could reshape business risk management programming to bring the most benefit to Canadian farmers. We have a very diverse panel assembled here today with producers from horticulture, livestock and grain sectors, as well as some academics who have studied agriculture related to the topic at hand. I look forward to hearing each of their thoughts as we tackle this important issue facing our industry. So let's meet the panel. First, we have Tyler Fulton, a Manitoba cattle producer. Tyler, me, there you go. Um, next, we have uh, Dave Sept from Golden Spruce Nurseries in British Columbia. Uh, next is Alan Kerr, professor at the Department of Food, Agriculture and Resource Economics from the University of Guelph. And last but not least, we have Glenn Fox, professor, Department of Food and Agriculture and Resource Economics, also from the University of Guelph. Um, I think Mary covered this, but I'll just remind folks some housekeeping here. Uh, there will be a Q&A once all of the panelists have finished presenting. Uh, you can submit questions in the chat box along with your name and organization and the name of the panelist you are directing your question to. Um, we would like to recommend that you wait until the end of a particular presentation to submit your question just in case it's answered later in the presentation. Okay. So uh, with that, I think we'll get started and I'm going to kick it off uh, with the presentation here first. So if I can get uh, my slides put up on the uh, on the screen, there we go. And uh, if I can get you to move forward one slide to uh, one with, the, there we go, perfect. Okay. So as you would have seen in the bios, my background in agriculture is deep. Having grown up in a grain farm uh, in Saskatchewan, I continue to be invested and participate in the operation of the farm, which gives me some firsthand perspective that I can apply to my primary career, where I find myself leading a team of over 600 MNP agriculture business advisors from coast to coast in Canada. This group services over 18,000 producer clients, which provides us with a broad perspective on how the business risk management environment has evolved over the last 25 years. Next slide, please. Our focus today will be to discuss how producers are currently tackling business risk management, what challenges we are, are we seeing, and what does or what could the path forward for agriculture business risk management look like? Next slide, please. If I put my business advisor hat on for a moment, I can share that MNP has made a number of observations regarding the ongoing BRM debate and the negotiations between governments and producer groups. I should qualify and emphasize that these are observations and not conclusions. I'm gonna share a few of those with you here today. The first one is existing government programs continue to be misunderstood. We continue to hear comments relating to existing programs, including but not limited to agri-stability, that, that suggest they are broken, they don't work, that they are not timely, and that they are not predictable or bankable. What is interesting to us is that many of the programs have been around in a similar fashion for about 25 years now, 
The very fact that the programs continue to exist is somewhat inconsistent with a lot of the negative commentary directed toward them. Next slide, please. The business risk management programs have not been self-revealing, so education and business acumen are a necessary part of understanding. Related to the observation above, we can see that criticisms are not always fair and suggest that education is lacking around both financial fluency and, and risk management planning. Investments in both time and money into education are needed if we want to see better risk management planning and broader acceptance of the programming, regardless of whether the programming changes or not. This observation is applicable to all stakeholder groups, producers, governments, accounts, um, and, but, but not necessarily every stakeholder individually, as we've worked with a number of folks who are very well educated on these topics. Next slide, please. Questions around the role of governments and the level of government responsibility need to be answered. Given the variability in opinions and formal asks of government around the BRM programming, it is evident that there are a wide range of opinions on what level of support governments or the private insurance sector should be making available to producers. In other words, do we as producers really know what we want from governments? And is that ask reasonable? Next slide, please. The approach that has been used in the past by industry when requesting changes to BRM might not be working as intended. This observation relates to all three of the prior observations. In order for producer request requests for changes to BRM programming to be actionable on a timely basis, there is a need for producers to better understand the programs that are already available. Be clear on what it is uh, they want within a reasonable range of government role and responsibility, and come to the table with well thought out asks that take into account and clearly communicate the nuances of various sectors while working towards some common unified goals for all agriculture in Canada. Next slide, please. And finally, as the size of our farm businesses grow, some programs become much less effective. Whether we like it or not, the reality is that many farms continue to grow in size. While we often hear complaints that these are corporate farms, the fact of the matter is the vast majority of farms in Canada, incorporated or not, are still family farms. And these large farms play a key role in the health and stability of our overall agriculture economy and food supply. If we are truly concerned about protect, protecting Canadian egg production, that concern would need to be reflected in the proposals for scalable programming options. Next slide, please. In conclusion, when we look at BRM in Canada today, we see a solid foundation in place that has taken years to build. Is it perfect? No. Can we make it better? Absolutely. The agri-stability revisions proposed by the federal government are good ones that will increase the coverage levels provided to all farmers immediately. Our hope is that they can be agreed to and implemented for all provinces. As we work to finalize this round of consultations and look forward to the new framework that will be implemented in 2023, there is much more that can be done to improve BRM. Today, with the thoughts from this panel and with the participation of the audience, perhaps we can move the discussion another step in the right direction. Thank you. Okay, so now I will ask Tyler Fulton to give us his opening presentation. Tyler, mic is yours. <coughs> Hi everyone. Can I get my, uh, yeah, perfect. So I'm gonna start off with just uh, a few words about our, uh, about our farm operation. And um, just to give you some perspective as to where we're coming from on this topic. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, along with my wife, Darrell, and our kids, Evan and May, we own and operate uh, Titan Farm Limited. It's a 600 head cow-calf backgrounding operation in Bertle, which is on the western side of Manitoba. <coughs> Excuse me. The farm was started by my grandparents and was passed to my parents, David and Verna, who are still active on the farm. The farm operates about 6,000 acres in prairie pothole country, which consists of both native and tame pasture and hay and annual crops for winter feed production. 
we grow approximately 300 acres of corn for silage and winter grazing and utilize another 300 acres of cereal crop mixes for late season grazing and feed grain production for the backgrounding ration. So to give you some perspective, we are um, the minority in our area in terms of uh, being a cow-calf operation. Um, they're still sprinkled kind of throughout Western, uh, Western Manitoba, but now it's predominantly a, a crop production region. Um, so our cows, they start calving in April and uh, the grazing season starts in May uh, when we start moving um, various herds through the 100 different paddocks that we have, um, usually about twice per year. We, uh, we engage in a program called VBP Plus, which is called Verified Beef Production Plus, which is uh, a program that's uh, part of the larger Canadian Roundtable for Sustainable Beef program. Uh, and the calves are also raised uh, following EU certification protocols and typically marketed on internet based sales. So when I was a kid uh, in the late 80s, my mother worked for a federal agency called the Farm Debt Review Board. In this role, she was involved with uh, selling, I'm sorry, settling farm foreclosures and bankruptcies. Um, that the farm crisis left the farm crisis and the and the prairie drought left in its wake from the early 80s. You know, we may have you know uh, experienced it or or heard stories about interest rates going to you know the mid teens um, and several years in the prairie provinces of of uh, abnormally dry years. <clears throat> and so it, that spurred on a, a number of, uh, of bankruptcies and foreclosures that um, that really required uh, involvement from from governments. And so I think it was her sharing those experiences that have stuck with me um, <clears throat> to make risk management the focus of my career, both on and off the farm. After I completed the degree, uh, my degree in agribusiness from the University of Manitoba, I started working in the field of livestock price risk management um, for a hog marketing cooperative. Uh, next slide, please. So 2020 proved to be a pretty tough year for our farm operation. Um, the prices that we received for our yearling calves, which make up the majority of our revenue, what is negatively impacted by the pandemic. Cattle prices dropped by more than 20% in less than a month. And uh, uh, that, that was obviously caused by the widespread shutdown and further exacerbated by the disruptions at the major Alberta beef packing plants in May. So there was just a ton of uncertainty associated with the second quarter in particular of last year. We also experienced abnormally dry weather in the latter half of the growing season, which cut our, our hay yields dr uh, drastically. So despite being enrolled in agri-stability, uh, we did not qualify for any support. We have, as a cow-calf operation, we have relatively few eligible expenses. We're fairly self-sufficient um, in the context of uh, the expenses that you would report for agri-stability. Um, and so that means that our reference margin is limited typically um, and makes, makes the program ineffective for anything other than a complete disaster. We utilize crop and forage insurance to manage production loss on our corn and hay crops. And we received a payment that helped offset the poor hay yields caused by last year's drought. The program uh, with the most significant impact on our farm's financial, uh, financial risk is livestock price insurance. It allows us to manage calf and feeder price risk, which represents the single largest risk on our farm. This program is supported through the Canadian Ag Partnership, but is limited to covering administration costs only. There is currently no support uh, in, in the cost of the premiums as there would be for our crop insurance program. <clears throat> uh, 
Yeah, next slide, please. So um, inherent in our farm plan uh, are various risk mitigation practices. We follow a, a rigorous animal health protocols and take, uh, and take part in larger industry-led programs that mitigate the risk of foreign animal disease. Probably a, a watershed moment was really um, a couple of years ago when we saw, when we started to see the impact of swine, um, African swine fever uh, hit the hit the Chinese marketplace. Um, so, in my view, that has been the largest disruptor to ag in general over uh, for for several years, uh, and and I feel we're still feeling the consequences of that um, of that change. And so, as a result, we uh, we take a lot of I put a lot of value in Canada's uh, traceability program and we obviously take part. So with that, we have a premise, a premise ID that allows any animal that leaves the property to be traced back to this location. Um, we use those little um, yellow circles as RFID tags in calves. And so when the animals leave our, our farm, um, wherever they go, they can be traced back to this farm operation. Um, the, another, uh, on-farm risk management, uh, practice we follow is, uh, is one that helps us manage, uh, a shortfall in feed production, um, caused by weather events. So we grow a, a diverse number of crops, um, that perform differently in wet and dry weather cycles. This year, as I mentioned, we had, uh, very dry conditions from August 1st onto the, you know, right on through the fall. And so it cut our hay yield pretty significantly. Um, however, uh, we, we did have timely rains in the early part of the season, which led to um, what actually was the highest yielding corn crop that we had. So we find that the two crops of alfalfa and corn work as a, a good hedge uh, against really the different weather patterns that we can experience here in Western Manitoba. Uh, in addition, we have a marketing plan that adds resilience to our farm in order to protect the breeding cow herd, which is like the critical engine of our beef production. So what happens is we set up to market most of our calves either in the spring and possibly retain them even longer to put them on grass the following year. But built within that system is the potential or the, or the option that if we have a feed shortage, then we can um, sell those calves a good three months earlier and use the feed that we would have otherwise used for them to feed them to maintain the cow herd. Uh, and so it's kind of that kind of um, different timing of marketing that can um, that can preserve uh, the you know the that beef production engine, which is the uh, the breeding herd. Uh, next slide, please. So um, now to talk about the, you know, the considerations for, for future BRM programs. So every sector in agriculture, I think, is very unique and has a unique set of challenges. So it seems like an impossible task to create a program that will work well for every farmer. That's why I believe that governments are better to support industry-led programs rather than create them. The result will be programs that address risk in uh, that address risk specific to that sector um, as opposed to trying to um, cover all all gamut the, the gamut of, uh, of risks. And now I understand that there is a challenge of being trade friendly um, with this approach, but I think that there's a lot of room for improvement on this. So one example of, um, of what I'm talking about here is uh, I mentioned livestock price insurance. Now that's been an extremely effective tool and it filled a gap that was huge for the beef sector. But the, the program is actually offered to the hog industry as well, but it has had really um, very limited uptake. It's just 
not very effective because it's so extremely expensive. And so in my experience, my off-farm experience with the hog marketing cooperative in the Western, in the Western provinces, um, we, as part of my job, offer uh, fixed forward contracts. So the structure of that is that we're effectively using the Canadian dollar futures and hog futures to um, create a, the, a tool for a forward price in Western Canada. Now that forward price doesn't have a premium associated with it. So that's a really important feature for a very, you know, what has been a really tough industry, a, a low margin industry over the course of the last 10 or 20 years, really, since I've been, since I've been involved. And so the development of a, of a hog price insurance product um, to me was a, um, a waste of, uh, of funds because really the, it, it just was not at all uh, in the realm of something that could be uh, viewed as a, a, a tool that's util, utilized because of the cost associated with it. The next point um, that I'd like to make is, is that it's imperative that all government support in VRM programming is equitable. So a disproportionate support leads to shifts in a risk profile of a sector, which advantages some farmers and disadvantages others. So what I'm talking about there is, uh, you know, for example, um, the, the program of agri insurance um, that's offered, uh, you know, nationally. Um, those sectors that can take advantage of, a, of the crop insurance program with such um, good support from both provincial and federal levels um, inherently have lower risk associated with it. But there are still sectors that don't have access to any type of program like that. And so what happens um, is that those investment dollars and, um, and the expansion of the sector with that lower risk profile ends up dominating um, the whole, uh, the, the other sectors. And so I think it's really critical that, um, that equity is, is one of the key um, driving factors to, to new developments in the program. And it's, it's, a, it's a tough, uh, you know, a, a tough challenge for sure. Now this may be a bit controversial, but I think Agri-Invest um, should focus on risk management um, and support the development of a sector or a farm specific program. And while I believe that risk management practices are best directed at the farm level, uh, I'm not convinced that Agri-Invest provides an incentive to develop these practices. So what I would suggest is that maybe um, those we could develop a, a system where those dollars um, are used in a program that would be approved and uh, you know programs that could be um, driven and managed by uh, by the commodity uh, associations or or, or even um, at the farm level and that you know if you don't have uh, a program that works for you maybe maybe uh, you've learned to manage your risk through the use of your own futures and options uh, brokerage account um, as as we have uh, on our farm and and so that maybe some um, some support that is directed specifically for those purposes and practices um, would be a better use of of the of the agri invest dollars um, instead of effectively just receiving a cash payment with with absolutely no outcomes of risk management being um, assured. Um, I think there is room for improvement um, to make programs more complementary. When I think of premiums that we pay for insurance, um, whether it be for crop production or livestock prices, um, there's a lot of overlap in the protection level. Um, that's granted by other programs like AgriStability. Uh, so if we could design an efficient program where they, they fit together, um, then I think the costs would drop and, and protection levels should increase. <clears throat> so
So what I mean by that is if agri stability, if we have confidence that agri stability provides a very base level of protection against the, you know, a disaster level, then why do we need to have other programs that are also covering that downside potential? Really, we only need to cover the threshold that takes us to, you know, to the level of coverage that we want to start at on the top end down to that top disaster level. So I think that there's room for improvements uh, to get more efficient on, on that front. Um, and lastly, uh, I think that I think it would make a ton of sense to to put some greater effort into um, into uh, developing more options for risk management education. Now, albeit I'm pretty biased on this front, this has been the focus of my career. But my experience with uh, working with hog producers um, has really informed um, informed our practices on our farm, uh, and I and I think what I've learned is that the a dollar spent on the education of risk management programming for certain sectors uh, is one that gets a lot of payback. And I've just been super impressed by the degree to which um, individuals will will take that basic level of education and then apply it and 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 really um, start to take it to another level. Um, it just uh, it's it's very heartening when you're when you're part of that process. Um, so that's really about it. Uh, next slide. I think uh, I think if the if COVID nineteen pandemic has taught us anything, it's just that you just never know what risks uh, you could be exposed to tomorrow. And so um, with that, I will leave it and look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Tyler. Very good uh, presentation. Yeah. And uh, couldn't agree more on, uh, on some of your key points there. Um, next up is Dave Sept, and I'll ask Dave's uh, presentation to be brought up. And uh, the mic is yours, Dave. Um, for the panelists, we are about one hour from uh, our end time now, so we will uh, we'll need to try and make sure we give the audience some time for Q and A. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Stu. Um, some of the stuff in my presentation will echo what Tyler's talked about. Uh, I have some points that agree and a few points maybe that disagree. Um, if you've read through my bio, uh, it's got some information there, kind of gives a background of where we're at. I have two business partners in this company, and I'm very fortunate that both of them have a, a background in, in managing risk uh, and in commerce. Uh, one of my partners is the treasurer of the BC Landscape and Nursery Association, and he's also now accepted a, a position as a board member of the Agricultural Credit Corporation. And my other business partner, he's a retired chief wildlife biologist for Western Canada. So. Between the three of us, we have a uh, different perspectives, which help us moderate each other's uh, rushing into danger. Uh, if you move to the next slide there, please. Perfect. Um, I get a lot of flack every time I get to one of these meetings because I live out on the wonderful West Coast. There's proof there that it does snow here occasionally. Uh, the little picture to the right is what's happening right now in the nursery. We have new, uh, cuttings that we've propagated that will be shifted on into larger pots. Uh, when you guys go to the garden centers this uh, spring and summer to purchase things, a lot of that material ships from our area. Uh, my specific market is quite uh, regionally local. We deal with the Metro Vancouver area. Um, there are a lot of other um, producers in our area that ship east. So even as far as uh, the Maritimes and Quebec and Ontario and all across the Prairie provinces, a lot of that stuff comes from our space. Move to the next slide, please. Um, so a little bit about us. We don't qualify for many programs outside of Agri Stability and Agri Invest. Um, we can't get any insurance for crop production. Um, our biggest issue for us is cash flow on a seasonal basis because there's a massive, like most farmers, uptake in cash in the fall to get things moving. Uh, and then you wait quite a period to get paid. Uh, that advanced payment program that is administered for us uh, by Ag Credit Corp is a great tool. Uh, the increase in support in that program after the canola producers um, realized that they had 
uh, a large amount of um, issues to deal with um, has really benefited us. So um, AgriStability and AgriInvest are really our biggest tools to manage. Um, you know, we do pretty uh, strict budgeting at the end of every year to project what we're going to do next year. And, uh, you know, that is a good tool for us to sort of map month by month, you know, where we need to be and we can stay on top of our expenses that way. Um, we continue to plant sort of seeds of opportunity with different um, uh, people, whether it's potential employees, um, potential clients, uh, potential suppliers to, you know, cultivate um, all those different relationships to continue to grow our business. Um, and even though we are part of a larger association and a broader marketing group within the BC Landscape and Nursery Association, uh, we do um, uh, spend a lot of time focusing on how we are visible to our customer base. Uh, we've grown by over 100% in the last six years. We've gone from about 1.2 million last year we did $2.6 million in gross sales. Um, so if I can move to the next slide, I've lost my video feed coming back. So I'm hoping you guys are hearing me. Um, so producers are not just farmers. And some of what I'll talk about later is just the nomenclature within sort of the BRM programs. And, and I think producers is a really good one that I, they actually get right here in that uh, they're not called farmers. You produce a product that's, you know, consumed by somebody and, and you need to be more than just a farmer. Uh, there needs to be some business acumen. Uh, you are now a small business owner. Um, you know, many people go to school for commerce and to, to manage business. And, you know, there's a lot of people that work on family farms across Canada that are, you know, they're forced into the role of having to deal with that kind of things, but they don't have a lot of education behind it. So, you know, to Tyler's point, I completely agree. There's room for improvement in that. Um, I think there's also times um, where people, especially in the smaller family farms, will make emotional decisions based on what they feel needs to be done, as opposed to, you know, doing a really good cost benefit and, and running through scenarios where they can identify in advance how they might deal with a loss or, you know, with a struggle. You know, BRM is not a sexy topic. Um, COVID in our industry really brought to light some things that has generated some conversation. Um, you can move again to the next slide. Um, so I think uh, a change of mindset needs to happen a little bit. Um, if some producers, you know, they say the program is working because they never get a payment. So, you know, if you're just looking for a payment, you know, is it a handout or do they feel that they're struggling? I know margins are shrinking. <clears throat> um, and I think farmers that have been enrolled in um, programs for many years uh, have seen the coverage shrink, um, especially, you know, at NGF2 when, when the funding was cut significantly that, you know, they used to maybe see payments and now they don't. And so they feel that the program isn't working. Um, from an education standpoint, uh, I did attend a, a workshop um, that the several years ago for uh, BRM um, um, uh, education. And it, it was a very um, popular, passionate topic that there's many different levels um, from accountants to producers to academics to students that felt there needed to be a greater need for people to understand what their risks are and not even in a, just a financial um, manner. Um, there was a pilot put forward um, at the time uh, called AgriShield. Um, it's now been rolled out and I actually didn't get any word that it was available until I went to look for it for this presentation. So you know, there's a great tool out there um, but from a producer or an association level, how uh, we've missed, you know, getting that into the hands of the people that need it, it you know, is, is a bit of a challenge. Uh, I found it very useful to walk through that and it identifies all kinds of different scenarios from um, uh, health, mental health, personal health, uh, succession planning, a whole range of things that people don't often think about even within labor. Um, I think there's also a lot of producers that will sit back and let others take the lead. You know, there's 
the top 10, 15% of any commodity group or sector that uh, continues to push forward and they're um, you know, very proactive in, in looking to find solutions uh, and, and, and move the, you know, the bar. And then everybody else, you know, 40, 50% will sit back and they'll take that up if they see it look successful. And then there's maybe another 30 or 40% that, you know, they don't understand it or, you know, their fear of the unknown, um, you know, creates a risk without them um, taking up that program as well. Um, so there's uh, lots of different producer groups and provincial associations. Um, I think that have a bigger role in promoting BRM. Um, and it gets brought up occasionally, uh, more so recently as we've had this discussion moving into a new policy, um, but it's still not a, an attractive topic. And it seems uh, one of uh, immense frustration because very little movement gets made for a lot of effort. Um, but I think on a producer level, you, you know, producer associations and commodity groups should be perhaps you know, making better outreach to their uh, membership to, to promote that education. Um, you know, on the, my previous slide and the one that this one shows, the three main points I think is that you need to be engaged in your business within your association and in your commodity. Um, educate yourself as to what's available um, and, and how that can be used to benefit your business specifically. And then put those things together in an effective manner that will actually, you know, produce you a result. Um, if you can move to the next slide. Thank you. Um, so there's some things that I can control easily. Um, you know, I can control production, uh, yields and capacity uh, to some extent. Um, you know, if you have crop insurance uh, from a yield standpoint, you know, you, that, that helps you there. And, and we don't have that. Um, financial planning, um, uh, labor, and I, labor continues to be an issue that gets brought up. And it is a main issue that we have. Uh, you know, we only operate on our main farm on about seven acres, but I have 14 full-time employees, which for most farming operations of this size, you know, if you're in anything else, it's a crazy amount of people that you need. Um, I think the, the biggest thing is in the past, you know, you'd find a person, you'd train them, you know, they'd fill that role and they'd be with you for a long time. Uh, there's a fear of losing those people. Um, and so that fear sometimes prevents you from getting somebody else because you don't want to have two people doing the same job and feel like you're paying too much. But uh, where it might have taken 10% of your time to devote to labor in the past, I think it's probably 40 to 50% of my time now, but it is an accomplishable goal. Um, the uh, agriculture um, sector has several different labor initiatives ongoing. Um, the seasonal um, agriculture worker program, which brings, you know, uh, people from Mexico and, and Guatemala and, and Jamaica up our way to work in our sector, you know, has really helped to fill a void. But, uh, you know, at the same hand, the unintended consequence of that is the labor pool at the bottom that's doing all the work, um, you know, they've pretty much displaced all of our domestic labor. So you have got people that are local that are management level, um, but as they get closer to retirement, there's no one in the pipeline to, you know, to move up the ranks, to fill those roles, to, to manage the next group of people. So it's now created a new problem where you, you don't have an opportunity to, to move anybody up. And so to find domestic labor, move them into that role becomes a challenge. Uh, you can't take seasonal agriculture workers and put them in that role. Uh, and so we've got now a new problem that's developed because of a tool that we've created. Um, so continuous work engaging potential employees, uh, whether, you know, that's 4-H groups for some people, uh, trade associations, uh, social media outreach, there's, there's a whole host of things. And, and it's something I work on continually. Almost every day I've got something. Uh, our website has career jobs posted on it. I've got advertisement running uh, with colleges and stuff like that. And it takes a lot of work to get even one or two good people. Um, and when I get them, my policy is, you know, if I find someone with a good set of skills and tools and attitude, I will find a way to mesh them with my business. Uh, and then I'll look at the rest of my business and who's there. And if there's somebody that isn't performing as well, and, and just trying to find a way to either get the most out of them or, or let them go. Just, 
but you need a, a constant pipeline and it is tough for sure. Um, from a marketing perspective, and this varies dramatically, Tyler's got a, you know, their own different uh, marketing program. I said, for us, we're regionally, and we sell mostly to, you know, uh, school districts and um, parks departments for cities, landscape contractors. So we're very visible. Um, we don't have a, a broader um, marketing group like Dairy Wood or anything like that. But even in, within dairy, you know, our area heavily in dairy and poultry, you know, I can see farms that that market themselves specifically, whether it's organic or they're they're doing something to do with um, uh, biogas recapture and energy production. And that visibility in the marketplace, I think, helps to build for your business and for your whole commodity as a whole. Uh, if we can move to the next slide. Um, so there's things that we can influence that we don't necessarily have a lot of control over. Um, you know, weather, we all wish we could control the weather. It's going to be a nice sunny day here, it looks like, once the sun comes up. Um, global market conditions um, and, and things brought on by political unrest, um, by COVID, um, by um, trade uh, barriers that have been brought up because of these things. You know, we have had issues with beef and, and canola and grain production shipping to China. You know, the farmer can't really control many of these things. And so I think that's where the government support has to, to kick in. Um, you know, no one to eat steak in the recession. So there are some things that some commodity groups are affected by just based on, you know, where the whole market is. If, if everyone's feeling flush and we've all got cash in our pockets, we're more apt to spend money on more expensive items. And whether that's eating out at restaurants, which helps bolster a lot of the food ag industry. Um, so some of the questions that I have as I've been working through this for a few years now is, you know, will BRM programming change actually lead to more or less risk? You know, there's inherent risk to modifying a quantity that we actually know and we know what the problems are. Um, but if we make drastic changes in any one direction, you know, what are the unintended consequences? Are we going to actually have less support than we thought we might? Um, so we have to be think careful in what modifications we might be looking to make in the future going forward, because uh, there are often unintended consequences when government decides to place support, especially when it's not equal amongst everybody. Um, we can move to the next slide. Again, I don't have video, so I'm hoping this is working on your end. Uh, it's all it's all working good there, Dave. Uh, but we, we, we just to stay on time. If, do you think you can bring us all in about four minutes or so? Yeah, I think I can do that. Perfect. Um, Thanks, Dave. Yeah, I have audio. That's good. Um, funding. You know, if we only have so many dollars. We rearrange the deck chairs. We we still have the same amount of stuff. So, you know, if overall funding can't change. Um, then we really got to look at what we can change and we think we need to have the courage to change it there. So I think everyone's seen that saying, you know, God grant us the serenity to accept the things we cannot change. And if we can't get any more money, then we have to be courageous and understand what we can change and, and move forward with that. Um, so, you know, for a long time, pursuers or associations have asked for, for more money. Um, and if there's more money is not available, then how do we split more equitably the money that is available. Um, and that may seem that some producers will see a drop in some programs and other programs have more push to it. I don't want to pick on the people that have production insurance. It's an important tool, but you know, from my point of view, it is probably subsidized unequally across the province. Um, every province, it's ministers that have a program differently. And I think, you know, overall across Canada, about two thirds of every dollar spent on BRM goes into crop insurance. So for all the sectors that, that can't benefit from that, you know, there's an inequality that we need to look at there. Um, okay, if we move to the next slide, I think I only have three or four more, but I'll, I'll see if I can breeze through them. Um, so replacing, I've heard some talk about replacing agri-stability with insurance. And I think the devil's in the details there. You know, if you don't feel that you're going to have a bad year and you don't want to participate in the insurance program, um, rates are, are generally set, you know, based on participation. So the fewer people participating, the higher the premiums are going to be. Agri-stability premiums are 
are really low um, for the coverage that you get. Um, there are some issues that need to be addressed within the BRM suite of agri stability, but I don't think agri stability is completely broken. Uh, there are some things that we can change to do with, uh, you know, allowable expenses, um, you know, production margin caps for large um, um, farm operations for, you know, there is enough coverage on the top. Um, but, you know, I don't know if there's a better program out there. I think tweaking the program we have currently is still a better way of looking at it. If you want to move to the next slide. Um, so within agri-stability, you know, there's the main complaints, you know, that I hear from our producer groups and from other ones as I've been working through this from over the last couple of years is, you know, timeliness, predictability, and, and coverage. And from a timeliness point of view, I think that really comes down to the producer. Um, you know, the, the government can't, you know, produce you a payment if you don't give them all their information in a timely fashion. And, and there's many producers that don't file their taxes, you know, until the summer and supplementary documents aren't sent to their agri stability, you know, you know, people till, you know, the same time, summer, or even to, to fall, it takes them some time. So, you know, if your fiscal year ends December 31st and, you know, all of your filing doesn't happen until, you know, June, July, then it's November before anyone's going to start talking to you. So there may be an ability for, you know, the people involved you know, whether it's the accountants that need some education as well, um, maybe the um, uh, administrators within agri-stability, you know, nationwide and those offices get more proactive reaching out to the farm and looking for those supplementary documents. And I think a lot of the year-end supplementary stuff is generally to do, you know, with what inventory you have. So for, for Tyler, you know, how many calves, and how many uh, cows do you have, you know, how much hay and silage do you have, what silage do you have, that, that's all pretty easy to send in. Um, why people uh, issue that through their accountants, um, I think there's delays that are made there. You know, last year when COVID hit, and I'm sorry if I'm going on a little long here, Stu, but, you know, BC pushed hard because um, it was in March where we're beginning our strong shipping season to start filling garden centers, um, you know, across Canada where the semi-trucks are getting packed and moving out. And Ontario and Quebec just said, we can't take any product, everything's shutting down. So for us, harvest happens in spring. Um, and seeing that we weren't gonna be able to ship any product, there was a lot of people, you know, Costco and Superstore were canceling orders that were really looking at almost a complete loss in market. Um, so we had managed to, to work through our provincial and then up through the federal, um, you know, groups to get agri stability interim payments moved up to uh, end of April for opening and for 75% on the interim payments. I, I had a check in my hands, you know, in the, the first week of May. So, you know, communication, um, being able to talk to the people that, that need the information, um, that timeliness issue really is, is misunderstood because I think a lot of that falls down to the producer. Uh, from a predictability standpoint, you know, if I phone my agri-stability office, they could probably tell me tomorrow, you know, where my line in the sand is. Uh, as a business person, being able to interpret that and understand how my expenses and revenues work, you know, that requires a little bit of education and business acumen. But I think there are tweaks to the program that can be made, even within how they, the naming of some things, uh, you know, reference margin sounds like such an abstract term to most farmers that it can be hard to wrap your head around. Um, from a coverage standpoint, you know, BC, I've benefited because the province stepped up and so we get, you know, an extra 10% on the payouts, you know, everybody else across Canada getting 70 cents on the dollar when, once they qualify out here, we're getting 80 cents on the dollar. And I think that's helped quite a bit. Um, I know there's been some pushback in other provinces and that that's unaffordable, but you know, a lot of their money is probably going out, um, in crop insurance and, you know, the producers that receive good crop insurance payments when they have issues generally don't qualify for agri stability because you know that counts as revenue and again the farms have grown considerably in the last 20 or 30 years so uh coverage levels you know and program caps haven't really moved up to accommodate that so i think there needs to be some luck you know when you got farms doing five and ten million dollars a year in revenue uh you know two or three million dollar program caps really not going to help them if they have a catastrophic failure um, last slide. 
All right, one more in there. So, uh, you know, reference margin limits need to be addressed. Um, program needs to be equitable. There's only so many dollars and it seems that some farms get more support than others. Um, and I think that's the main crux of our issue and, and how to get past that is, is really um, probably gonna ruffle some feathers in some groups and, and it's gonna be a big challenge to make happen. But I think there's necessary change in order to make this work for, for all farms. So uh, if we're on slide 12, you know, BM Pro, BRM Pro, uh, improvements for the future, still think that agri-stability is our best model going forward. Um, there needs to be a uh, connection between uh, producers to get them empowered to and educated about their business. Um, maybe to shift the service model of how agri-stability is administrated to, to make agri-stability administrators a little more proactive um, so that we can get some more timely payments out to people. Uh, tweak some stuff within reference margin limits and allowable expenses to make the program more equitable for all producers. Um, Reevaluate how uh, inventory is dealt with in agri stability because, you know, if you've got a whole lot of grain sitting in the, in the silos and at the end of the year the price drops like a rock, um, you might qualify for an agri stability payment. And then by February, the price could come up significantly. And even though you've received a payment, you actually not probably do one. Um, so there needs to be a look at, at how your end inventory is dealt with, because I don't think that really works very well in the current problem. Um, and then just evaluate um, shifting some funding, you know, from one BRM module to another so that there's more, you know, equitability amongst all farm producers, pork, grain, beef, you know, you name it. We all face challenges. Um, but I don't think everyone's treated the same. I think that will end my presentation. All right, Dave. Well, it, it all came through good on our end, so thank you very much um, for that. And some that last slide there has some great uh, suggestions on it. So um, even though you didn't get a lot of time to spend on it, I think there's some really good stuff, and maybe we'll get to that in the uh, Q and A as well. Um, so thanks, Dave, for that. Appreciate it. Um, next up, we got Alan Kerr. Very much. Um, are my slides up? Do we not see our uh, slides? Not, not, I don't see them yet. I see W on my screen. Yeah. Can we get my slides up? Yeah, I don't see them either. be a technical issue there yeah it, well, have you got why don't i start your yeah least, go ahead uh, so i'm alan kerr i'm from uh, the department of food ag and resource economics at the university of guelph um and so i was asked first of all thank you for having me here uh secondly i was asked to uh to talk about two kind of issues. One is uh, the role of private insurance um, as we move forward in uh, 2023 with uh, with perhaps a new BRM framework. And secondly, um, uh, I have a lot of experience in the US. So uh, even though I grew up here in Canada and Ontario, I did about 15 years at the University of Arizona. And so I did a lot of work with USDA uh, on crop insurance and do um, have done a lot of rating of the products that the farmers down there buy and, and things like that. So that's my background and why I was asked to be here. Um, so Alan, uh, Alan, are, are we having any luck with my slides? Yeah, it sounds like your slides are up. I got a message from somebody who's, oh, they uh, are. who's attending the conference. So I guess just, just that we can't see them. So if you want to just uh, direct ah. uh, Catherine with what side you're on there, you, you should be good. Okay, so uh, why don't we go to uh, uh, the the first slide of the preamble, so the Institute. Is that there? So basically, um, 
Uh, I just wanted to uh, quickly mention just a little bit of background. Uh, I'm also, we have an institute here at the University of Guelph on uh, food and agriculture policy. And, uh, and while our comparative advantage is attracting uh, good students into the food and agriculture sector, uh, we also have done things on COVID. Uh, ASF got mentioned earlier. We do that. We did a looking at the effect of ASF on Ontario's hog sector. If there's an outbreak here in the U.S., and we did uh, did some uh, modeling scenarios for the negotiations and the trade liberalization uh, during uh, CUSMA. So, um, and next slide. Uh, I know we're tight on time. So uh, uh, this just some of the work I've done in, in BRM activities. As you can see, it's mainly in the U.S. Uh, so I have us uh, um, at Canadian BRM institutions. So I'm going to assume, is that where we are? Uh, one more slide. I see, there we go. Okay, now I can see it, so thank you. Okay, so um, as everyone knows, uh, the BRM policy is is not exclusively the federal government. It gets somewhat negotiated uh, between the provincial, federal, uh, in with industry, uh, and usually these are uh, five year frameworks. And um, uh, one thing that's that's quite unique uh, up here in Canada is the provincial crown corporations administer much of the BRM programs and have a big impact on the delivery and the structure of those programs, probably more so than than I think a lot of people realize. So, uh, next slide. So um, it seems to me, I've been here back in Canada about 11 years, and it seems to me that BRM is is always seems to be under constant review, um, but with good cause. I mean, the biggest monetary outlay for domestic agriculture programs is BRM programs, and there's a lot of money on the line. And so it makes sense that they're continually looked at, tweaked, uh, try to be improved on, things like that. Uh, my observation, I, and I should note, I'm not a farmer uh, or in the government, but my observation from afar being involved in some of these things is that um, changes uh, for 2023 and previous changes seem in large part driven by the overall size of the BRM budget and that governments are fairly willing to, to uh, do whatever inside of that budget, assuming it's trade compatible, but um, the, the big restrictions come in on the size of the budget and what that may mean for uh, for the programs. And I think that was the driving force between uh, Growing Forward 1 and Growing Forward 2 with respect to the agri-stability changes. Okay, next slide. Okay, so, and I was also asked to talk about BRM alternatives. So, so what are the alternatives and what questions should we ask? So, should we go back to agri-stability coverage to going forward one levels? Well, how do we do that? Can that, can the size of the budget increase? Um, do we fund it by increasing the greater co-pays? Uh, the last speaker talked about maybe rearranging, uh, you know, the dollars within the program. So maybe agri-invest. Reserves. Uh, there's, there, is that a possibility? Um, you know, is it a possibility that the farmers pay that layer of the premium and uh, and the government covers the operating costs? Is it some combination? So these are all things uh, that could be on the table. Um, another thing on the table, they have a number of these in the U.S. is shall loss programs. So where um, for small losses, things are covered. Um, and is this, could we do this by farm? Could we do it by an area? Maybe we want to do that. Should we do it uh, purely private? Is this something that uh, it got brought up earlier, the Western Cattle Price Insurance Program? Uh, is this something that could be like that, where uh, the farmer pays the premium, but the running of the program and the administrative costs and that are, are handled by government? 
Um, so there's that issue. Or uh, it, could it be handled privately with the government paying the uh, operating costs? So there are a lot of options on the table uh, to consider. Okay, next, next slide. Um, you know, do we go out and replace agri-stability with a revenue insurance? Uh, there are still issues of the copay and coverage levels, but perhaps there are a lot less transaction costs on farmers and governments to settle claims. Uh, do we replace agri-stability with an area type program? And then maybe there's a lot less transaction costs on the farmers with respect to reporting and timeliness and things like that. Um, here's something that's, that's, uh, uh, really never been considered and, and gets to the equity issue in the sense that all the coverage levels for the insurance programs are generally a function of expected yield or margin or your expected revenue and it's a percent of that. Um, but there's no reason it, it it needs to be that because maybe a 70% uh, coverage level like agri-stability is now uh, represents sort of a one in uh, 100 year um, event for one farmer, but a one in 10 year event for another farmer. So which creates some, uh, some significant inequity. So could, co could coverage levels be a function of uh, the frequency of losses rather than uh, as a uh, percent of your expected margin. And so all that is changing, it's just where the trigger is. And would that make programs a little more equitable? So that, that's an idea. Uh, next slide. Um, so I was asked to talk about uh, also about private insurance involvement and uh, and there is private insurance for property and fire uh, on the farms and hail insurance and then uh, there are some private companies like Global Agriculture Risk Solutions that are, are looking at uh, trying to do uh, kind of filling gaps and, and I'll talk a bit about that later. And then uh, provincial crowns, a lot of the provincial crowns uh, purchase reinsurance on the private market and so there is some involvement but on a on a big scheme things it's uh, it's very small and it's not just in Canada but in all countries uh, private insurance it tends to be very very small for agriculture okay next slide okay why is that so uh, private insurance, uh, you know, they have to, there's the pure premium of the expected loss. They have to have that covered. They have to have their administration and operating expenses covered, and they have to have their return covered, their business, just like, like producers are, their business trying to make money, um, and have a return to their capital. And so these, uh, in the premium rate for private insurance, uh, they have that, whereas public insurance, you know, they just generally have the pure premium rate and of which that is subsidized. So it's very hard for private insurance companies to uh, to compete uh, with public insurance, uh, not only here in Canada, but, but everywhere else. And so uh, there's always the option, you know, for, uh, some producers, farmers uh, don't want to purchase uh, insurance and would rather self-insure. So that's another issue. Uh, next slide. Um, so where can they coexist? Well, uh, certainly they can coexist to sort of fill in the gaps. I think there was a significant uptake in, uh, in private insurance uh, between uh, GF1 and, and after GF1 with the dropping of the agri-stability coverage level um, going from 85 down to 70. And, uh, and I know there are private programs out there that uh, are trying to fill that layer of risk that farmers or producers can purchase. Um, and in fact, uh, I'm not so sure I, I have that wrong. My fourth point, I say cap incentivized. Uh, that didn't come in with cap, but it's just come in uh, perhaps in the last 12 months where now private insurance um, is, is somewhat incentivized by allowing private insurance premiums to count as an eligible expense in your agri-stability, but 
the claims do not count against your agri-stability payments. And that's a big change versus what it was a couple of years ago when the payments counted against uh, any claims you made privately counted against your agri-stability payments. So um, that, that's a big change, big change. Okay, next, uh, next slide. Okay, so contrast with uh, with the U.S. program. I was asked to, to talk about that. Uh, I don't think it's that big of a, uh, there's that many differences between the U.S. and Canada. There are cases and things like that. There, there are a lot of differences on the one hand, but there aren't on another. So uh, the U.S. government offers commodity-specific yield insurance, much like Canada's agri-insurance. Uh, farmers can subdivide in the U.S. their uh, their farm. Um, they offer the U.S. offers commodity-specific revenue insurance. They offer area yield and area revenue insurance. Canada does not, and uh, and they offer a shall loss products, a number of shall loss products, and, and Canada really does not. But the U.S. does not have agri invest, whereas Canada does have agri invest. So, uh, next slide. And I would. Um, I would also say before I go on um, uh, that uh, they seem to have, uh, the U.S. has a number of programs, significantly more programs, rather than a bit more than one size fits all up here in Canada. So I'll say that. Um, the U.S. government uh, sets or approves premium rates, just like Canada. The U.S. government approves which insurance products to offer. This is very similar to Canada. Um, a big difference is private insurers and brokers sell products to farmers, unlike in Canada, where provincial crown corporations sort of uh, fill in that gap. Um, and interestingly, the private insurers share uh, somewhat asymmetrically in the underwriting gains and losses of those products in the U.S. So, next slide. Okay. Um, oh, I just said it to shares in that. The U.S. government uh, does not purchase private insurance, whereas we do have provincial crown corporations doing that up here. Um, one thing that the U.S. I think does does well that Canada could consider is there is a mechanism, and, and our earlier speakers talked about this. There's a mechanism in the U.S. of which commodity groups can submit plans of insurance for consideration in the U.S. So um, Commodity X thinks, okay, uh, this type of insurance plan would work good for our producers. Uh, then. They could submit that in the U.S. to uh, um, to USDA Risk Management Agency for approval through what's called the 508H process, and uh, and eventually that plan of insurance that was industry led could be approved and subsidized um, in the U.S. This there isn't really a a explicit avenue for that to happen here in Canada. I would say. Okay, next slide. Um, this is just uh, for your interest, provincial crown corporations, what's, uh, what's in their reserves, um, how much the A&O expenses, their reinsurance costs, and uh, you can see there's significant money um, in, the, in the fund balances of the, of the uh, reserves of the crown corporations. Okay, next slide. Um, yeah, just um, you know, they the provincial crown corporations, I uh, uh, you know, seem to have operated uh, cheaper than the reimbursement for the uh, in the private companies in the U.S. Um, they don't they do purchase uh, private reinsurance and uh, and they have significant fund balances. And we saw kind of a reaction to that in Alberta. I think. Uh, uh, Alberta's just taken some actions uh, in lieu of their high fund balances. Okay, next uh, next slide. I think that's it, actually. So, hopefully, I uh, I, I kept it uh, uh, short for you. Okay, thanks a lot. Well, thank thank you, Alan. I appreciate uh, appreciate the comments. Really good insights there as well. Um, so, last but not least, we're we're going to move to Glenn Fox for uh, his opening presentation. 
Then we're about 20 minutes from the end, so um, hopefully we can spare at least about 10 minutes for Q&A. If you can, if you can grant us that, that'd be great. Mike is yours, Glenn. You're you're on mute. I can't hear my, I, I can't hear you, Glenn. Am I the only one who can't hear Glenn? Oh, okay. There, I can't that? hear him. Oh, there, now I can. there we go. There we go. Okay. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the economics of environmental goods and services, which may seem out of place with, um, with the topic, but I'll, I'll draw it into the themes of this, uh, this panel as I uh, proceed. So can I have the next slide, please? So the, the broad context of, of my remarks is the recognition that in addition to the traditional agricultural commodities, uh, agricultural lands produce other things. Uh, and there are certain things that are considered uh, good that rural lands produce. And I'm going to talk mostly about habitat as uh, uh, the main category of these things called ecological goods. But agricultural land can also produce uh, ecological bads. And I've done quite a bit of work in my career on the economics of those things, but I'm, that's not the focus of my uh, presentation today. I wanna focus on the ecological goods and talk about three approaches that have been used uh, to promote uh, the production of uh, ecological goods from agricultural lands. So if I could have the next slide, please. This slide acknowledges that this is, uh, I'm gonna be speaking about work that I did in collaboration with some very uh, bright and hardworking graduate students who worked with me on various research projects and did master's thesis uh, reports uh, in this area. And so this slide acknowledges who uh, they are. Next slide, please. So the three uh, approaches that I wanna talk about are the first is the, the dominant approach that's used to uh, secure habitat on rural lands, uh, which I call the planning designation and regulation approach. I want the second approach, which I think is better, is the club goods approach. Uh, and then I'll have a few remarks on a, a, a new proposal in the European Union called the Farm to Fork uh, program. If I have the next slide, please. So the standard approach to securing habitat from rural lands is what I call the planning designation and regulation approach. Uh, what this involves is when habitat is identified, and this could be a woodlot, it could be wetlands, uh, it could be uh, other types of special natural features. When it's identified on farmland, then restrictions are placed on the use of that farmland through a municipal official plan or through other means. Uh, the argument for doing this is that there are broad social benefits from uh, in, encouraging the provision of these habitat services, uh, which is well and good, but there's typically no compensation to the landowner. And I think this creates two problems. The first one is that it's inequitable. Uh, the benefits accrue to everybody in the society, but the costs fall on the rural landowner. And so I think that that's unfair and rural landowners have made their voice clear that they think it's unfair as well. It also creates what economists call a perverse incentive. And the perverse incentive uh, works like this. If you're a rural landowner and you think you might have habitat on your land and it has not yet been designated or not part of an official plan, and you think that this might happen, then that gives you an incentive to do something uh, preemptively, uh, make the habitat go away. And there is evidence that this has happened uh, in the United States and in Canada on an extensive basis, uh, which really defeats the purpose of the, um, 
uh, of, of the, uh, the, the policy in the first place. From a risk management point of view, one way to think about what's going on is that this approach turns an environmental asset into a liability for the landowner. And if you're a landowner, uh, you want to get rid of uh, liabilities uh, and it's perverse to turn uh, something which we say we value uh, into a liability which can lead to its demise. Next slide, please. The second approach I want to talk about is uh, something that falls in the category that economists call club goods theory. Sometimes discussions of habitat provision and agricultural commodities limit themselves to private goods and public goods, but there is a third category that I think is more applicable called club goods. And a club good is a situation where a group of people organize themselves together, pool their resources uh, to achieve a shared purpose. And so it may be a, a formal club like a ski club or a golf club, but it could be another type of association. The importance of club goods is that while the club organizes itself to provide benefits for its members, inevitably the provision of those club goods provide benefits to non-members. Uh, and so how does this apply in this context? Well, uh, hunters and anglers have formed organizations to promote habitat protection uh, because they're interested in hunting and they're interested in uh, fishing and the habitat is part of the supply chain for that particular activity. So what they do is they raise funds uh, through various means and then pay landowners to uh, protect and maintain uh, habitat on their land. So this is the opposite of the designation approach because now this a thing that had been an environmental liability under planning and designation has become an asset to the landowner. This is an additional uh, revenue stream. And some of the organizations that have been involved in this are Trout Unlimited, Ducks Unlimited, Delta Waterfowl. My work and the work of my students has been with Delta Waterfowl on something called the ALICE program in Ontario. Uh, and under the ALICE program, farmers uh, may elect, and it's a voluntary program, so that's another advantage of this approach that if you don't want to participate, you don't have to participate. But if you do participate, uh, you get a payment and the payment uh, varies depending on the type of service that your land can provide. Uh, and uh, and uh, then you get compensated for the provision of the habitat, which puts habitat provision on a, a more comparable footing with other enterprises in the farm that produce uh, traditional uh, commodities. Uh, next slide, please. So what does this have to do with uh, risk management? Uh, there could be a risk management benefit from this club goods approach because it has the potential to, uh, to realize a revenue stream uh, which is uncorrelated with commodity prices. So in finance, we call that a portfolio balance benefit. If you've got two enterprises and the uh, distribution of returns is uh, independent, they're not correlated with one another, then if you have a bad year in one, then you're probably not gonna have a bad year in the other one. So there can be some uh, risk management uh, benefits. Uh, on the other hand, it's important to recognize that just as market conditions can go south, uh, charities, and that's what these uh, club organizations are, uh, can uh, default. Um, they can run out of money in various uh, ways. And for example, in the financial downturn uh, in 2007 through 2009, uh, some of the charities involved in this program actually uh, ran out of money. And so it's not that, that there's no risk, but it's a different uh, sort of risk. Uh, there is uh, a, a perhaps a downside uh, to the ALICE uh, model the, or the environmental goods and services model in that it creates demand for rural land, which didn't exist before. And the current users of that land uh, might not be happy that now there's a new player against whom they have to compete for land uh, rental. So there has been some pushback on the Alice approach in certain regions of Canada. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? I've been asked to say a few words about the EU Farm to Fork program in case you haven't heard about this. Uh, this is a, a, a current proposal in the European Union, a very grand uh, proposal, very broad. It 
tries to address in one program almost every conceivable problem of the food system, has some very specific outcomes that it's trying to achieve. For example, 25% of the land in Europe devoted to, to uh, organic production. The USDA has taken this proposal pretty seriously and done some global commodity modeling uh, work suggesting that if the EU were to do this, then there would be upward pressure on global food prices. Uh, the good news of that is that Canadian farmers would benefit uh, from this because uh, product prices would go up. Um, what are some comments on this? First, I think it combines problems that have different causes uh, and, uh, and would be better served by different remedies. So I'm not sure that we gain anything by agglomeration. It's always important in Canada to recognize that any policy in the EU uh, is subject to implementation by the so-called member states, and there can be quite uneven application by the member states. I don't think it's likely to be implemented, <clears throat> excuse me, in its uh, current proposed uh, form. And having done some comparative subsidy work looking at farm subsidies in the EU and uh, other places in the world, uh, I would uh, caution Canadian producers looking at the EU to be mindful of the proposition that I put in quotations. Uh, the subsidies are always greener on the other side of the fence. Uh, European farmers think that Canadian farmers are subsidized more than they are and vice versa. And the truth uh, sometimes uh, is nowhere to be seen. So I don't think the EU farm to fork program is a model for Canada. It may not even be a model for Europe. Um, but I think that the club goods model has the uh, potential for implementation that could be uh, beneficial to agricultural land owners in Canada. And that's my presentation. All right. Well, uh, thank you very much. That was uh, very good. And thanks to all the panelists uh, for their presentations today. So um, that wraps up the opening statements. Thank you to all of, all of you for that. Um, and now it's time for the Q&A session. Um, as a reminder, you can submit questions in the chat box along with your name and organization and the name of the panelist you are directing your question to. Uh, Matt Houston, the CFA, is going to ask all the English questions and uh, we have an interpreter to uh, interpret any ones that are written in French, which will be uh, spoken in English. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Matt if you have uh, the first question ready. Yes, we have a question from Reg Enns from uh, BCAC. This question is to Alan. Um, is the comment that provincial crown corporation purchase reinsurance is this just an internal risk management tool versus self-insurance? And does that add structural costs to the program? You're, you're on mute, Alan. Your mic's muted. Sorry about that. Got it. Yeah. Um, Okay. Um, yes, it does as, add structural costs to the program. Uh, those reinsurance costs are are uh, then put back into uh, to premiums, which are then split between the producers and the provincial and federal government. Um, and uh, it is a bit of an odd odd uh, policy to do this. Uh, I can't think of any other. Uh, um, public entity in a developed country that buys private reinsurance. Um, uh, USDA does not, FCC does not. Um, and so it's, it's, uh, it's odd. It's very odd. In fact, uh, I think uh, Alberta got out of it this year for their agri insurance, but not for the uh, PIP program. Thanks, Alan. Matt, do you have another question? Or does anybody else want to chime in on that? Okay, Matt, do you have another question for us? Uh, as of right now, there are no other questions for. Okay, um, I'm going to ask uh, one quick question here. I think we still have time for one more. So uh, we'll uh, we'll direct this one at uh, anyone who wants uh, to answer it, um, but probably more so for Alan, Dave, and, and Tyler in this one. 
Calls for uh, government support during the onset of the COVID uh, pandemic brought to light a fundamental question for BRM. What's your perspective on the government's role with respect to responding to losses? Is it to make uh, the farm whole? Is it to stabilize their income to ensure no impacts on expansion and investment or simply to keep them from going under? Anybody uh, wanna tackle that question? Okay. Um, sure. Uh, can I throw up a fourth option that, that maybe, sure. uh, certainly I, I think, uh, it should not make, uh, Canadian producers, farmers uncompetitive, uh, on the international marketplace. Um, if, if that makes sense, if, uh, if government A, um, is, uh, it, is funding much more than uh, government B, it creates this uh, this uncompetitiveness. And so certainly our programs should make sure that, w that uh, we're not uncompetitive, uh, putting the, the producers uncompetitive on the international market. And, uh, and I would highlight, we, it doesn't seem that that's the case right now. Uh, producers are very competitive. Um, throughout a lot of sectors on the international market. We export a ton. So. Uh, thanks, Alan. Does anybody else want to chime in on that uh, question, just as to what you think the role of government should be? Yeah, just really quickly, um, my view would, would uh, I mean, I totally echo what Alan just said. Um, I think it's, I think we need to be we ha we need to have clearer goals from the government as to what their goals are. Um, if the goal is to support growth in the sector, um, then then I don't believe that uh, you know that that we need to be um, you know treating. I think we need to keep we need to keep all sectors uh, equitable um, equitable. Um, but I don't think we need to necessarily uh, treat all individuals uh, exactly the same. And what I mean by that is um, if we know that most of the growth is coming from, you know, a, a younger demographic, it's possible that maybe we should be directing uh, a little bit more of those BRM dollars to support those that are at greater risk. Now, I'm very cautious about saying that because sometimes that, you know, could cause an, you know, an unintended consequence. But, um, but I think what's lacking probably at at the government level is, is a, a transparent kind of framework as to what the goals actually are. Great, thanks, Tyler. Dave, did you have any comments on that one? I might as well throw something in here, yeah. You know, I think the profitability of each farm is really the responsibility of the producer. So, you know, catastrophic loss due to a weather event, a geopolitical event, or, or anything that is without, you know, cannot be controlled, you know, by the producer should definitely be within the purview of government. The line between, uh, you know, supporting that growth um, and income stabilization gets a little muddy from farm to farm, depending on your support level, you know, but a holistic, you know, risk managed farm, you know, should be able to weather most storms. So uh, yeah, you're going to have great years, you'll have okay years and you have bad years, but you know, only in the bad years should support really be given to farmers. And I think, um, you know, going back 20 years, you know, more support was probably given than was needed. And so there's some farmers that are, are, are still looking for that support. And support needs to be there as a safety net, but not as something that is sort of counted on on a year-to-year -year basis. Okay, great. Um, do we have the time for one more question, folks? We're about two and a half minutes out, or do you, would you like me to wrap it up, uh, Mary? Uh, Matt, did you have any more questions on the chat function? Uh, no, there are no further questions okay. at this time. All right. Stu, if you have any uh, closing remarks, we could go there and wrap it sure. up. Sure. Sure. I, I, 
I just, you know, one thing I wanted to just point out is in Dave's presentation, I think uh, there, the timeliness issue around agri stability is absolutely something that uh, needs to be looked at. And, uh, you know, working in the accounting field myself, we're, we're very aware that we are, are contributing to that problem. Um, and I think we need to look at it as, as accountants as to how we can do a better job of bringing better timeliness to that, to the uh, turnaround on those agri stability returns. Um, it is a it is a shared responsibility though with producers, and so we can't file the, the applications if we don't have the information. So we've got to work together more uh, on that for those of us who are are helping uh, producers file those applications. So I did want to just make a, a note on that one and acknowledge that it's a good comment by Dave. Absolutely something that needs to be looked into. Um, okay, well, it was uh, my pleasure to, to be your moderate, moderator today. I'd like to thank all the panelists again for taking the time to be with us today and share their insights. Uh, we'd also like to thank the audience for their participation and uh, for the question that came through. That was great. Um, and I hope we can uh, incorporate some of these great ideas that we, we heard about today into the negotiations for the 2023 BRM framework. So with that, thank you very much. And I'll turn it back over to uh, Mary. Thanks, Stu, and thanks to all our panelists, Alan, Dave, Tyler, and Glenn. It was a, a very important discussion and uh, really value the uh, the time and effort you put into preparing uh, for today's session. Appreciate that and look forward to the uh, conversation that it's going to certainly uh, create within our organization and uh, in agriculture and the community at large. So thank you very much.